So I like to start this off before we get into the outline and what we're doing today with some eye openers. Statistics are a good way to do that because they somewhat tell a story. So starting off, what are your take on amputations that occur every day in the U.S. workplace? Or every year if you want to extrapolate out for a year, how many, how many would occur in a full year? Just guesses. So there's no right or wrong answer. Each other, I'd say four per hundred. Four per hundred people? Right. Four percent? One a day? One for every hundred. Okay. Any other guesses? Too many. Actually, 21 amputations a day in the U.S. workplace. It's pretty high, about 8,000 a year. And that's not unusual. The last five years we've tracked this data, and it's remained relatively flat, not going up, not going down. Despite economy, despite other outside influences, you think that would fluctuate the numbers? <coughs> 8,000 a year is somebody losing an appendage of their body. Jim? Yeah. Is that bone amputation, if I remember right? Yeah, that's major amputation, not just a fingertip. Actually, yeah. yeah. How many deaths do you think occur every day in the U.S. <coughs> workplace? Let's go with three. Three. Hopefully less than the amputation rate, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We've already got the bar set here, so hopefully it's less. So, so what did you say? Depends on what they got amputated. Yeah, that's true. That might have caused a death. Any other guesses? About 14 deaths a day in the U.S. workplace on accidents that are avoidable. This isn't just somebody dying in the U.S. workplace from a heart attack or of other natural causes. It's more going to be it was an avoidable accident. 14 a day is a big impact. About 5,000 a year. And guess what? Do you think that stat's been spiking or dropping or remaining steady for the last five years? It's been flat. It's been flat. It's pretty disturbing, really, with all the efforts put into voluntary protection programs and OSHA's enforcement and citations going up. It's very difficult to affect that number. We'll discuss why later. How many years has OSHA's lockout tagout regulation, that's the regulation number for it, been in the top 10 most cited regulation list? Probably ever since they created the list. Yeah. That's it. That's it, actually. Ever since they created a searchable online list, Lockout's been in the number one. It's 15 years now. It's been the number one, number one most cited for uh, manufacturing, number five now for all industries. And every year since they've created this list, it's been in the top 10. It usually fluctuates between four, five, and six. Do you have any stats for other countries where they Track of things like this? Good question. Well, on the next slide, I do. Oh, all right. In China, <laughs> <laughs> their death rate is three. Yeah, is three hundred and seventeen percent higher than the U.S. So it kind of tells you: Are we are we horrible, or are we you know are we good? Kind of why you're asking, right? Because yeah. how does it compare? We're all humans, so what are the, what are they doing? Kind of what is your competitor doing? Three hundred and seventeen percent higher death rate in China. And theirs is remaining relatively flat as well. They were really proud their death rate dropped from 90,000 to 83,000 one year. 83,000 people dying in the, in the Chinese workplace every year. This is their number of workers, and this is our number of workers. So this is a good number to know. Percentage who die in the US workplace of the number of workers. And that's where the percentage is higher than ours. Ours is 0.003%. So of 1,000 workers, and you'll have three that die of those 1,000 workers in the US. In China, of 1,000 workers, you'll have 10 people die. The US-China difference, 317%. Now, I'm going to bring the stat back to home in a second, but first we're going to take a little tangent. There was a recently published top 10 most dangerous jobs list by the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. Number eight on the list is industrial machinery maintenance worker. It's the first one on the list that is avoidable with lockout tagout. The other ones are airline pilots, loggers, yeah. fishermen. Lockout tagout wouldn't save their life. It wouldn't be applicable to controlling the hazardous energy or understanding the machinery. It's just, it's just an inherently dangerous job. If you're in a plane and something goes wrong and you're 
fighting a fire, it's, you're going to crash. That's pretty much your only option. If maintenance workers is the first one that has the option to be safe, and they're the number eight most cited or most uh, dangerous job in America. So that's our authorized employees. That's what we're going to call them now. That's pretty much everybody in this room is going to be affected by that. Either your people you work with, people who work for you, or maybe you're applying the locks yourself. So this is 5.6 times the US average in the workplace. Why that number is important? How does it compare to China? US authorized employee for the manufacturing maintenance workers is higher than the Chinese workplace that we were just appalled by. That was 317% or 317% higher than the US. Did I go over those numbers too fast or do you want me to review them? Let's back up. China, way more dangerous than the US. Number eight most cited is pretty much affecting everybody in the room. And that, even though it's number eight on our list, is more <laughs> dangerous than Chinese <coughs> general workplace. Very good stats. And I can give all of these numbers to you later if you want the exact numbers. I have the data and sources for this. Yeah. That's interesting, right? Brings it home. Because then we get to say, how's the US workplace compared to China? And think, ha, huh, give ourselves a pat on the back. And then say, wait, when you look at the people who are in the workplace, that's not good. It's still pretty dangerous in our manufacturing environment. Do you have some European staff? I do. And I've actually uh, researched global lockout tagout statistics because we have global clients. And industry-wide, or industry-wide, globally for all industries, Lockout is common, or uh, energy control programs are common globally. There's a program in every country that requires it in some fashion. They don't always require lock. They require energy control program. And the statistics are a little more difficult to get because US is very open source with the US Bureau of Labor Statistics accessible information. Uh, the injury tends to be underreported in other countries. However, it is, tends to be lower than the injury in the US. So I'm not sure if it's a higher level of manufacturing in the US or dangerous jobs or what it might be. But the overall average tends to be less in most other countries. China was an obvious example of a worse case there. So what we're going to see is uh, generally what people think of machines. You know, they can overpower them. This guy is going to try to outpower a lathe here. I kept it on mute because there's some cuss words when they start it up. So you see some one guy in the back there. He's going to flip the switch. He's going to hold it. Oh, then he grabs his pant leg. And then it pinned him in the machine. It looked, luckily, his friend turned it off probably just in the nick of time to give him a really bad bruise. Probably sprained his ankle if he's lucky. I mean, we all know what that could have happened if that stayed on, right? That could have wound him up in the machine, killed him. You saw how it flipped him right over there like he's a rag doll. These are two case studies we're going to go into that ESC was a part of by either we were on site while it happened or we were brought on site because it happened. The first one, we were on site while it happened. It was a large pharmaceutical company on the East Coast. It was with an exhaust fan. Of all of the equipment in a pharmaceutical company, bioreactors, pumps, heat exchangers, this is probably the least complicated piece of equipment there, the least likely to hurt you. This authorized employee had 10 years of experience. I'd say he's pretty seasoned for being there. Didn't follow the lockout procedure they had. We were there to replace text-based procedures with graphical to make their job more intuitive, more efficient. They already were compliant. We were there to make them more efficient. He failed to dissipate kinetic energy when attempting to change the belts. So what does that mean? Yeah, he shut off the power, the electrical. So replace the Kinetic energy is defined as anything that can be moving after you shut off the power, as far as lockout is concerned. He did not wait for it to stop. The real back end story was he was trained to slow the belts down by covering his hand with whatever he had, a glove or a rag, and putting his hand on the top of the belt. But this time, something caught, pulled his hand into the machine, went around and pulled his arm into the machine. Is there a certain distance uh, a disconnect is supposed to be from a machine when you lock it out? Electrical disconnect or isolate yeah. valves. The yeah, requirement would just say that you. Yeah, there's a requirement that requires 36 inch clearance in front of it, but it can be anywhere in the machine as long as it's not within the moving area of the machine. But can it be 50 feet from it? 
Yeah, it can be a mile or two of work for a minute. That's why procedures are so important, because once you get the ones where they're not easily isolated, procedures are required by law. So the end result here, he was doing something he thought was safe. He probably, do you think that was the first time he's done it? In 10 years? No. It's probably the hundredth time or more that he's done that. This time it got him. He was dodging bullets left and right. 21 stitches. Initial cost, 75000 to the company. He thought he was saving 15 minutes before waiting for that fan to slow down. Investigation, workers' comp, etc. Not to mention their, their insurance rates are going up now because of this another incident on site. Uh, and morale's kind of ruined from that. So there's a lot of intangible costs. So let's talk about root cause here. Obviously, he stuck his arm in the machine. I won't, I won't test you on that one. What could he have done? Could have waited a minute for it to stop. Could have waited, but what if it took 15 minutes? His work order said he only had 15 minutes to do it. That's the real life scenario, right? That's what gets these people in trouble. His work order says you have 15 minutes to change the belt. You already had the belts with you. You should have been easily done with that. Then you challenge the work order. Challenge the work order. So rewrite this, the program. Break on it when you stop it and stops it. Re-engineer the machine, that's a good one. Now let's add another element. Let's say that exhaust fan is controlling a room full of high value animals. And if they don't evacuate the room's air, the animals will die. And that could cost several million dollars in a big PR problem. That's probably the case here. They're using it for testing. So shutting this down can't take longer than 15 minutes. Re-engineering the machine wasn't practical at that moment. What could he have done to still get his job done but not suffer 21 stitches? OSHA will allow for this too. Stick something in there so it can't spin. Something other than his arm, right? Right. An old, broken down 2x4, doesn't matter how ugly it is, anything other than your body can be used as a tool to keep your distance. Pretty even that's dangerous. It is, yeah. but it's, it's risk reward benefit. And those are the things where if the 2x4 gets stuck in there, or if it's done in a way with proper training, in this case, that's not going to cause harm to him if it's done correctly. It might cause harm to the machine if it's sucked in the machine. So those are, those are solutions, keeping tools to keep your distance, using tools. That's the solution. And that's one where after training, he realized he very easily could have done something like that, apply pressure to the belts to, or wait for it to stop if that was practical. Obviously, that would have been less costly, waiting for it to stop than stopping it early with his arm. The next case, in 2006, we were brought on site because this had happened. It's a manufacturer in the Midwest. Authorized employee had 30 years of experience. They had a procedure. He didn't follow it. Failed to lock out the electrical. And he failed to lock out the potential energy. So what's the potential energy in a 300-ton press? Gravity. Gravity is the biggest. Electrical is a puny comparison. The electrical spools up the flywheel pulls up this press for cycling. The flywheel is a huge amount of kinetic energy retained. The potential is what killed him. The press fell on his upper body, crushing his head, causing death instantly. 30 thousandths of an inch, that's basically amputation. It's not crushing. He actually put his body in harm's way without the machine locked out. 30 years of experience. Do you think that's the first time he did that? And from what I'm hearing, we're, ask, we're asking how to emphasize the importance to workers. Because some of these workers have 30 years experience, and they're going to get trained by you, and they're going to go right back out there and do the exact same thing, right? So it's hard to get through to them sometimes. Is that one of the biggest issues is complacency? I've done it before. I didn't get hurt that time. Exactly. There's a statistic that says two-thirds of, of uh, workplace accidents by lockout tagout are caused by employees with two or more years of experience. Majority of the accidents from lockout tagout are caused by employees with two or more years of experience. So after about two years, I think you're going to get used to the dangers and start to see them as haven't gotten hurt after this long, after this many times of doing it, probably not going to hurt me. If you told me to put my head in that press the first day I was on site, I'd be like, I'm, I'm out of here. I wouldn't do it. But in 30 years, there was probably, you know, one time he stuck his hand in, next time he stuck his arm in. Next thing you know, he had to stick his head in to look at a photo eye or something, and, then, and he did it, and he didn't get hurt. 25 more years go by, and, and then it trips something different, or somebody hit a switch, or something fused out, and crushed him, killed him. Could have easily been solved with a $17 lock on the equipment, and a 
a lot. I bet if you look at that photograph close enough, there's probably a block you can swing in and sight somewhere. Usually, more modern machines have them engineered in. Right. Uh, older machines need a specially designed block, but it should be nearby. He shouldn't have to go get it or definitely can't use a 4x4 four four piece of wood here. It just give you a sliver before you die. Pretty much. 300 tons or more than it's designed to hold. And there are places that sell custom made blocks for those that are designed to take the tonnage, mm -hmm. even under a full load. Yep. So you can have the magnesium, different, different metals made to take that full impact. Mm -hmm. Consistent material is key there, whereas using wood is a common mistake people make because it's handy and cheap and it's inconsistent with knots and probably got hit by a fork truck and chopped and old and stressed in a brittle little time. So wood, we just don't recommend at all. Talking about wood though, there's a slide we'll give of what the maximum pressure a 4x4 can take. It's 10,000 pounds, 5 tons. So even at best case scenario with a brand new piece of wood with no knots and no inconsistencies, that's the maximum pressure it can take. So at least knowing that, they wouldn't have accidentally used that there. So this is an actual image uh, recently posted that is another country of somebody getting caught in a bigger machine. So we saw the person not respecting the lathe, but it looked like they were a high school student, maybe early college. I mean, this is a much larger piece of equipment, pretty much the same scenario. Maybe he wasn't playing with it, but he's working on it and around it without locking it out. Otherwise, this wouldn't have happened. This is lockout, tag out 101. This is exactly what they prevent. So, in addition to what we brought up here, the intent behind 147, the when to, the what to. How to comply, avoid common pitfalls. How to identify and control common energy sources. How to write effective lockout tagout procedures. And lastly, how to make it all work efficiently. Like Pat said, mounting the procedures at the point of use. Do you think that's required by OSHA? That's why most people don't do it. They do the minimum requirement, which is a binder that collects dust in the safety manager's office, right? That's it. OSHA's the minimum wage of safety. Yeah. This is the and what, what's safety. practical isn't just for efficiency, but for safety, because if it's practical, it's more likely to get what? Yeah. Get used by the employees. But you see all these workers all have the same mentality. Get it done, get it done quick for either taking a break or they were tasked with it. Maybe they just wanted to get the process back up and running. Their mind's on the problem. And if their procedures are not right there, looking at, at the face when they're ready to dive into that problem, whether it's the steam valve or the conveyor system, it's really easy to just dismiss the energy sources you're working around. So this is the outline today that we're going to somewhat follow unless somebody gets us off on a tangent, which usually happens. We're going to do corporate policy and general safety. Then we're going to dive into a networking session, lockable, then non-lockable energy sources. And this, I'm probably going to breeze over because it's going to be a little bit of overlap with what Pat's going to be introducing. And I want to allow him to speak because it's OSHA's perspective. You know, we're, I'm the owner of a consulting firm that this is what we specialize in, but we're an outside for-profit business. This is going to come from OSHA. And I think that's a valuable uh, perspective that I, I don't want to deprive you of. So I'm going to gloss over these even though this is the core of information that you would give your authorized employees because they need to know what they're working around, how to de-energize it, how to isolate it, how to work safely around it. This isn't something you'd want to gloss over to your employees, so just, you know. Then we'll do lunch and hands-on lockout. We have a couple of machines around to do that. And then we're going to show you the latest and greatest in development for lockout tagout efficiency. It involves QR codes and an iPad. And you guys have some brochures in your folders to give you some cue on that. So what is lockout tagout? Let's start with the basics. Lock and tag. The lock prevents somebody from restarting that energy source. And the tag does what? Identifies. It identifies who locked it out. So that when, they, when somebody else comes up because the manager said get that machine running, they don't just see a lock with nobody's name on it. They see a lock that says Steve Smith. I gotta go contact Steve Smith to get this thing running. They don't just think, I gotta get bolt cutters to get this thing running. 
because that lock is impersonal. With somebody's name, picture on the tag, the more personal you can make it, the more people connect the dots that somebody's life is on the line. It's not just a lock impeding it, it's somebody's life on the line impeding that machine from running. So the OSHA citation trends, 65% increase last year in lockout tagout fines. 65% in one year jump in lockout tagout fines. This is the biggest jump in the 10 years history of this company doing lockout tagout. You think they're trying to make a statement? Or do you think they just all of a sudden open their eyes a little wider? OSHA's trying to make a statement. It doesn't matter, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of perspectives of why the fines are going up. Sometimes it's different administration, Democrat, Republican, different agencies get different fundings depending on who's in office. The 65% jump in one year hasn't occurred in the last 10 years. It's the biggest one year jump. Why do you think it's going up that much? Paying Listen. more attention to the issues? OSHA is definitely paying more attention, for sure. The problem's always been there. Just recently, within the last two years, OSHA's putting the fatality count on their own website, OSHA.gov. They're airing their dirty laundry. They don't hide it anymore. It's always been available, but it's been tucked away. Now they're, they're putting it out there right on their home page like it's a speedometer or a tachometer. Are we going red line? Are we keeping it flat? They're trying to get that number down every year. And because lockout's the number one most cited regulation in manufacturing, that's the low-hanging fruit to get that number down, right? It's the biggest impact they can have is to go after lockout tagout. I talked to one OSHA citation officer, and he said one of the reasons that fine went up isn't the increase in frequency of fines, it's the increase in magnitude. Each person's fine, it's about the same number of fines going out every year, so that they didn't have to hire extra OSHA inspectors to do more inspections. They just made the fines go up bigger punch. So what was 100,000 is now 200,000. What was a million is now 2 million. And before when they used to negotiate down after you fix a problem, now they stick you with the full citation. That's how those fines went up. And quite frankly, that's peanuts compared to what you have on third party liability if you have a multi-employer situation. You get a couple lawyers involved, they're going to they're going to take a $70,000 OSHA fine and turn it into a couple million dollars. For sure. So, yeah. How are these violations found by OSHA? Is that doing a audit that OSHA is doing? Mm -hmm. Or are, are they informed by... So let's do this as a two-part. I'll do my perspective, then you do yours. Okay. And I know you want to talk to this. <laughs> the uh, OSHA inspections can come about in two ways. You get an accident from an amputation or death, they will be on site guaranteed. Then there's an employee complaint, then they will schedule a phone call and they might be on site, depending on how overtaxed they are. Then there's the random inspections. This is probably the least likely of why OSHA will be on your site because they're overstretched. Their, their funding is probably was a 50th of what EPA funding is. Very, very small funding for a very big problem. So their random inspections a very low part of why they're on site. They do target industries. And some, sometimes they'll send out random inspections, but they're target industries so they can get that biggest impact from being on site. They won't just show up at this office because of random inspection. But the likeliness of that is about the same as winning the lottery. So they definitely will show up for employee complaint, <coughs> amputation, or death. Random inspection is the other wild card out there, but it's very unlikely. What's the perspective now? now? My perspective is that after working for OSHA for 30 plus, 34 plus years, it's a lockout violation is, for one, you look at the machine, you look at the procedure, if they have a procedure, you talk to people, and if they're not doing it, they, they quite often will tell you, or you ask them what the procedure is, and they don't know where the heck it is. Uh, that's, that's been pretty common. Um, or you look at the procedure, and it's, a canned program that really has nothing to deal with the actual stuff on the site. It'll just say, turn off all energy sources. <laughs> and you ask them, what are the energy sources? And they go, well, electrical. Well, gravity comes into play, pneumatic. Uh, potential pressure lines, uh, de-energizing pressure lines. 
Uh, all that comes into play, and it's easy, low-hanging fruit for the OSHA person to look at the procedure and issue a citation. Um, because the procedure, if it's inadequate, and probably 50% are, and I think I'm being conservative as to how many are inadequate, but I've looked at numerous procedures and they just, they don't address things. They miss, I've, I've done fork truck fatalities where they miss locking out on a fork truck as gravity brings the forks down to a leaking cylinder. And the guy dies from positional asphyxia as the cylinders, as the uh, forks came down and squeezed them. So you've got to look at all the issues and uh, most people don't. They just look at what's obvious and lockable. They don't miss, they don't look at what gravity, springs, things like that uh, take into account. And it's pretty easy to cite. And then it kills people. And if it kills somebody, we're in there and they're in there. It's nice to have retired in December. <laughs> uh, but the, you know, it doesn't, it's, if you have a body and it's related to a lockout, it's an easy thing to find something wrong because most people have something wrong on it. You have to pre-plan and most people don't pre-plan until afterwards. And then hindsight becomes 2020, and this is hindsight. So we don't address a lot of the aspects. Complaints. Uh, we see a lot of com there were a lot of complaints on lockout. Um, lock complaints are handled in two different ways. You get a formal and a non-formal. Formal, we go out there and do an inspection. Non-formal, what we would do is we would send a letter. And if you send a letter with a procedure and the procedure is inadequate, they re review that procedure and they will do a quality control evaluation. So you may end up having a quality control inspection on your response too. By the way, if you get a complaint, never rip on the complainant in the letter. Because the complainant gets a copy of that letter and it's a good way to set up a discrimination case down, downstream if you rip on that complainant. So uh, just address the items, <coughs> do not address the person who you think filed it. Mm -hmm. If you do that, you're setting up a wonderful discrimination case. And only valid current employees can issue complaints, right? If they were terminated and two months later they filed a complaint, you don't listen to those? Or a rep of employees. Um, so it could be a, um, it could be union a rep. union rep uh, could file it. Um, yeah. Or you could have a lawyer who has a current employee file a complaint. Right. But they have to be a current employee. It has to be a current employee. Or terminated because of what the complaint is, right? Right. It was it was related, related yeah. to a discrimination yeah. case, which so, was a lockout case that set precedent on discrimination down at Whirlpool in Ohio. Right. The employees refused to do the work, were fired, and two employees went up there and did the work and died. So it's important to know too, employee complaints, they have to be a current employee, but what's the likelihood of having a disgruntled current employee in today's workplace with the number of variables there? Pretty high. Yeah. It's hard to make everybody happy, right? Okay. And so that's one that can bring them in. If you know your program's not compliant and they know your program's not compliant, and then they don't get a raise that year, guess what? <laughs> They're going to find a way to pinch the company back or something like that. So we see that a lot. They might not have said anything about the program for 15 years, but now that they feel disgruntled, that's their motivation. So why wouldn't you listen to them if they got fired? They said something right away. Because OSHA would be overwhelmed with disgruntled employees. Everybody who's fired is disgruntled. Which is and why it's not valid at that point. The, the non-formal complaint procedure was set up to deal with some of that. So there's always going to be a response to it, and there may be a quality control inspection on that same disgruntled files that complaint. But it has to be an employee or a rep of employees to file that complaint. It also could be a competitor trying to damage the business, so you know, trying to call OSHA in on them. OSHA is not there to be a, a police for hire. They're there for current employees to protect current employees. Yeah, if somebody gets a job and they file a complaint because they don't like the way people are doing a job, um, you know, because their competitor is doing it, uh, say a construction site, uh, that's pretty common. And it's just, it would just overwhelm. Plus, you look 
really dumb doing sour grapes bitter complaints. So there's nothing there, yeah. So there's five major components in the lockout program. One of them is not required, and we'll get to that one at the end, but it's, it's definitely needed for a good program. So we'll go through those five right now. Does anybody want to guess what they are before we get into them? Or do you want me to get into them? I won't. I won't test you. The five components. Training for your authorized and effective employees. Lockout procedures. Annual auditing of those procedures and the authorized employees. Lockout tagout equipment. That's the number one thing people think a lockout program exists for, is locks, tags, and devices. They think when we ask about trade shows and we talk to high volume of different companies, they say, do you have your lockout tagout program? Oh, yeah, 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 we got that. We got master locks, locks, tags, devices, got their lockout stations. I'm like, oh, okay. Do you have lockout procedures? They're like, hmm, what's that? Lockout what? And we show them the machine specific procedure. They're like, oh, yeah, we have like a general procedure for all of them. And that's what Pat was talking about. That's exactly what they see. And they're like, huge fine. It's been out for since 1989. I think you should know how to be compliant with lockout tagout by now. But also with the lockout equipment, uh, one of the things I used to do is just look at the locks and see how they're used and abused. Mm -hmm. And if they look pristine, I know they're not using them. So then it makes you probe deeper and exactly. look for a current process. So make sure you get your locks really dirty. Throw them through a grease bucket. They should sell them that way, right? <laughs> Like I used to have my picture on my lock because I would lock my own stuff out when I'm doing an inspection. And there's probably a lot of spit and potential infectious, infectious, <laughs> potentially infectious material on that lock. So. Oh shit. <laughs> yeah. Then there's the last component that I mentioned. It's not specifically required in lock in 1910.147, the federal regulation. I talked to OSHA about this, and I think it's kind of Odd that they left it out. And they left it out on purpose to give companies leeway so that they can include it in the, they can include all the relevant information in their procedures, or they can include it in their policy, giving them some leeway to do one or the other. So if you can have your means of enforcement and your list of authorized employees and all the details necessary for compliance in your procedures, then you could be compliant. But guess what happens if you put all that information in every procedure? Too complicated. Information overload, I call it. I've seen procedures that are 15 pages long for a pump. I'm like, it's got three sources, suction, discharge, and electrical. Why is this 15 pages? It's because it has all their corporate policy information. Lawyers help write it. It protects the company. But does it protect the employee? No. It was really hard to find the information they needed for that. So that's why we say separate all the redundant template, one-size-fits-all stuff, in your, and put that in your policy, and the specific information, the high-performance information that the employees need, Put that right in your procedure. One thing that we struggle with, because uh, we went down the path of writing a, procedure, I mean, a specific procedure for every piece of equipment we have, regardless of how similar the equipment was. And so then when you get to the auditing part of it, uh, I mean, you're required to audit your procedures annually. Yet, if we had wrote a procedure We've got five machines that are exactly the same in configuration, the same process to lock and tag them out. If we wrote one procedure for that group of machines, then instead of having to audit five, we would have been auditing one as the group. That's correct. And OSHA have released letters of interpretation that allows for grouping mm -hmm. similar procedures so you don't increase your burden by going above and beyond regulation. So you could audit one in that group. However, the problem is, you, you have five pumps that are all the same. And you could have created one for all five because they were all the same when you installed them. Ten years goes by. That gate valve changed to a ball valve. That ball valve changed to a butterfly valve. Now each procedure is different. Sure. And now you need each individual procedure, but it didn't get updated because you only had one group procedure for all five. Right. And so that was a problem. So what we recommend, even though it somewhat creates a, more of a burden, is make your auditing more efficient so it's not such a big deal to audit each one. It should take, your audit should take five minutes at the most per, per machine. And when you have a new program that we're implementing, it should take 30 seconds. You Correct. walk up, you scan it, you walk through your audit, you're done. You move on to the next one. So then you don't have to try to pinch pennies and cut out efficiency here and there by auditing select groups and 
random sampling. So you just audit every procedure every year that you create it, and then when that one pump changes in the group, you've identified it, right, when it happened, yeah. How do the people that are auditing these things, how do they know exactly what they're looking at? They have to be trained on what to look for in an audit. Who's doing the training? Somebody who's qualified. The OSHA leaves a lot of leeway of who. <laughs> yeah, thank you. No, this is good well, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. This is good that they leave the leeway because then it allows you to outsource your auditing to companies like us that specialize in it. If they said it has to be an authorized employee or it has to be the employee's manager, what's going to happen when that employee's manager is overtaxed and doesn't have time to do the audits and he can't outsource it now? But to his question, again, that flexibility also creates a lot of difficulty in defining who's qualified. You know, for auditing, it's actually the person who's better to do the audit is the person who's not even an authorized employee. You know why? Or why do you think? Familiarity breeds contempt. Mm -hmm. Complacency. That person auditing that press with 30 years experience, do you think he's going to take that audit seriously? Oh, he's going to look at it and walk around like that. That's good. Let's stick around top. <laughs> he doesn't want to look at it. But you get that intern out there who was just hired, and he's jittery and scared, and the whole, you know, he doesn't even like these sounds of these presses coming down. He's going to look at that thing and be like, I don't understand anything on this procedure. He's going to read through every little detail. He's going to look at it. He's also lower paid, so they want him to spend more time on it versus somebody who's a 30 year veteran maintenance technician. He's going to be the highest level paid employee. They're going to say, yeah, get, done your audit. get done with it fast because this costs a lot of money. That goes back to your two year theory in the beginning. Mm -hmm. with yeah. The same so, as far as auditing, it's a very low level task for lockout, and it's very easy for non-qualified people, people with less experience, I should say, that have been trained by the company to do the audits. Outside contractors, although I'm biased, are perfect for audits because we come in with an outside perspective, experience, and we can blow through your whole audit program with a third party perspective and find all the discrepancies that might not have been identified by in-house resources. So you have two options. Hire somebody specifically to do your audits, recruit somebody who was an effective employee, like an office person who's available, to do, train them to do the audits, what to look for, how to read the procedures, train them on energy sources, and then have them go out there and look through the equipment and do it. Or uh, you know, have your authorized employees do them that aren't directly applying the lockout. One of the issues I see a lot of times you get people that are not trained or not knowledgeable about how to do that inspection. They can look at something. Exactly. That's the problem. Yeah, that looks safe to me, and but have no clue. What they're looking and not, not sure. being <coughs> malice about it, but just not have the knowledge of what they're looking at. Yeah. That's why with the solution we had at the very end, I hate to skip ahead, but I actually like it. I got to go off my tangents. It, it's an iPad program that trains the person on everything they need to know to do the audit. So you have consistency now. Every person has the same level of information. You can incorporate that in with a comprehensive test to make sure they comprehend all the information. Somebody was asking about uh, <coughs> emphasizing the importance and getting the info across to them, making sure that they absorbed it. Those are the things that if you're going to have one person go out and do 1,500 audits, it's probably worth it to put them through four hours of training and say, this is all the energy sources you can encounter. This is how our lockout format works. I know you did this last year, but this is how things have changed. Also, we had a new department 105, and, and this is what I want you to be aware of. Fork truck traffic increased five miles per hour. You know, things that you want him to be aware of before he goes out there or she goes out there and does the audit. Everything they need to know to be safe while they're doing the audit and what to look for in your procedures can be trained in about four hours to even non-technical people. And I recommend using non-technical people as long as they're competent. That's up to your judgment call. Because they're less familiar with your process, your equipment, your machines, and they're going to look at details that people with experience will overlook. The magnitudes and the energy sources. Did you get that gravity? Did you forget about spray? What about thermal? Hey, did you know cold is also thermal too? If it's cryogenic, that counts. It's not just heat. And so those are things where a college intern is going to pick up on that very quickly and get done with it in a way that somebody with the 30 years of experience might not do it so thoroughly. Good questions. Those are the exact solutions that get your program working versus just trudging through the same problems of saying, I've given it to the same authorized employee every year and I've had issues with it every year. Or he's never found this mistake. This mistake was, this pump was changed five years ago and he's audited every year and he's never found that mistake. So what's my confidence in the whole audit of the program now? 
One other thing that should be thrown in on here is you know making things more efficient and positioning of lockout stations where people can lock out. So when you have new equipment brought into a facility, you should look at where those lockout stations are going to be, where it's going to be, because you want to pre-plan to make it efficient for them to lock out. You can have a disconnect back at a panel, or you can have a disconnect right next to that machine that somebody can disconnect, and they're more likely to disconnect when it's, when it's closer and nearer to them than they are to walk half a mile to the main electrical control room and shut that off. Well, you may value engineer that machine to eliminate that disconnect for whatever bean counter is getting that price. You may be looking at a long-term maintenance cost or the potential that they're not going to lock it out downstream. Because of that. I've actually did work for SHR for the WAX, back in, down in uh, Sturdivant. They spent the money to apply a lock next to each lockable energy source and chain the lock there. And that was the lock that somebody would put their personal tag on, one key for that lock, so it's compliant. Talk about efficient. You didn't have to issue additional locks, your authorized employees. Usually it was one lock to do most tasks, they felt. And so one person could walk out there when they're authorized, use the lock that's right by the isolation point, lock it, pull the key, keep it with them. Efficiency just went through the roof. So they were all about $12 lock to get a 2% more efficient line that's worth making $5,000 a week. It makes sense.